Well, after a day of record high temperatures that reached 70 degrees in some places in eastern Pennsylvania to New Jersey, not in southern New England and Long Island, but they got to 60s too, uh, as did uh, the Hudson Valley, and much of the east enjoyed a pretty decent weather day. A stormy weather pattern lies ahead with lots of rain, and you know what that means, folks? Gloom and doom. Uh, and we'll have all that gloom and doom tonight on the Joe and Joe Weather Show podcast brought to you by Tempest by Weatherflow. Get the revolutionary Tempest weather system and join the fastest growing observing weather network on the planet. The link is pinned to the descriptor to this. Hold on a second. There we go. Um, the link is uh, uh, on the descriptor to this live stream. And to this podcast and use the coupon code WINTER2324. Because if you do, you will get... You'll get a big 10% off, Joe. Yes. And a good Sunday evening to you after we've been off for a few days here. Uh, Took an extra day on Thursday. Getting that time of year, I guess. Uh, Welcome to everybody on the chat board tonight. And uh, those of you lurking in the background. Uh, We'll get back to those lurking in the background in a moment. Um, Welcome also to you. Uh, The Joe and Joe Weather Show is on Sunday night through and Sunday through Thursday at seven thirty-five p.m. The occasional Friday and Saturday when there's some sort of big weather event uh, in progress, we'll always let you know if we're going to add an extra show. If you like the show, hit the like button because we love it when you get over a hundred likes and Joe gets to ring the bell, uh, which he loves to do. And make sure you turn your notifications on so you don't miss us. Miss us. So uh, here's what I'm getting at with those lurking in the background. Now, now Joe, we know that um, SPC watches this show religiously, uh, <laughs> as does WPC. Um, however, I found this very interesting. So if you think back to last Tuesday, okay, last Tuesday when we were talking about the West Coast blizzard uh, that um, happened and is now winding down, uh, at random, I picked uh, Truckee, California. And I believe I read that forecast on the air that they had, the Weather Service had. uh, And we always marvel at those uh, forecasts that are out in the Western Mountains because they have snow amounts that snow lovers would just beg for, and they have it for days and days in the today period, the tonight period, the tomorrow period, the next day, the next day, the next day. So when you do all the math, it comes up to, you know, way over 100 inches. But I sort of found it fascinating this morning as I was flipping the channels on um, and happened to watch what I think is actually rather unwatchable. Uh, is the um, I, I I happen to to stop at um, the ABC station here in Atlanta, which is Channel Two, and uh, Good Morning America was on, and just by sheer coincidence, Joe, sheer coincidence, I'm sure they were where would you where where Truckee, California. Okay, now we could say it's a coincidence. I don't know. I can't prove it. Our 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 lawyers tell us that they, while working hard at it, can't prove it either. But <laughs> they were there in Truckee, and and this leads me to another question, a more serious question. I don't think this was a secret that they were going to get a big snowstorm there, correct? Well, you were targeting it, especially just a week ago. So how could we possibly uh, say it was? Right. And the weather service, okay, the weather service had blizzard warnings and winter storm warnings up. I think they put them up Tuesday night. You know, we always marvel when they put them up. Uh, may, maybe it might have even been Monday night, but when they put when they put them up really early, so that begs this question: As I'm watching a lot live shot of Interstate 80, okay, 
which looked like I-95 in rush hour, all right, um, just to add five feet of snow or more on the roadways. Stalled Mack trucks, stalled automobiles, and on and on and on. And I just asked myself, did these people live in a hole in the ground? Did they, don't they have, don't they know there's something called the internet? Do they not have, hello? maybe they don't have cable in California. Everything else there is illegal. So, I mean, I just was, I was, it was mind boggling to me. You know, thankfully, they didn't ha ask anybody. You didn't have somebody with a soundbite that said, well, I didn't know there was going to be this blizzard out here. Um, but it just, it just, it boggled my mind to see all that. Well, it uh, certainly should not have been a surprise. What's really amazing is just the amount of snow. I mean, Joe, remember uh, last week we were reading off for the every 12 hour period and, you know, one 12 hour period, you know, 12 to 18 additional inches of snow. Then the next 12 hour period, 16 to 20 additional inches. Then the next period was like eight to twelve. You know, it got ridiculous. Well, so no, you it you saw that forecast I sent you from Saddlebrook, California, that yeah, had I mean, it had just ridiculous. It, it had seasonal snowfall amounts in a one twelve hour period. You know, right. twenty four to thirty six. You know, there were third the number thirty plus showed up in like every time frame. I I, I was I was just I was just and then of course they could put somebody in there put snow showers. <laughs> Well, you know, a lot of people here in the East have been complaining about the fact that it's been too warm, too rainy, lack of any snow. I'd like you to go now and take a take a trip out to someplace in Utah or uh, California or Nevada and make that same complaint to the people who live out there. And they probably will punch you in the face. <laughs> I mean, it, it all depends upon where you are in this great country of ours. Some people are, if you're a snow lover, this is famine here in the East. It's more than a feast. It's just too much. I mean, if it were possible to take a, the equivalent of Tums for your, uh, for your snow, uh, you know, for, for the fact that you like snow, because really, you've really had too much out there. Somewhere out between here and there, somebody's having a normal winter, but it's, it's certainly not us, and it's certainly not the folks out west. No. Oh, well, <clears throat> and they haven't had much, to be fair. They have it's not like last year because last year it started in January and went right through the month of March. It was one after another, after another, after another. I mean, it's been more sporadic this year, but it, it, this one, this one made up for some of that. Let, let, let's put it that way. In the meantime, um, a couple of notable things happening today. We had record high temperatures. Newark got, Newark got to 70. I think New York City got to 68. Uh, Bridgeport it was 64. Kennedy was 68. Um, I White, was a little White Plains, White Plains tied their record from 1972 with 64, and we got to 63 here in beautiful downtown Putnam Valley. And I think it was New York City, although I'm not 100 percent sure of this, but I'm pretty sure it was. Uh, for the month of February in New York City, this is the first 2024 first time this has ever happened where you went the entire month of February without a daytime high at freezing or lower. Wow. I mean, that's how, that's how warm this winter was. And, and a number of places are coming in already, uh, particularly in upstate New York. Um, Syracuse got a gift late last week with, a, with about uh, eight, eight or nine inches or so from, you know, a band that set up there from Lake Effect. And it was, it was pretty much like the band that set up across central New Jersey to a few weeks ago. But uh, it's just um, <clears throat> record highs after record highs. Now, on, on, on uh, excuse me, <clears throat> on Saturday, the rain yesterday uh, outperformed model forecast guidance by almost 100%. I mean, a lot of places got one to two inches of rain when most of the model forecasts going into it were along the lines of about a half to three quarters, maybe the odd inch here and there. But uh, it was a soaking rain. And looking ahead to this week, we have uh, one, two, three storm systems ahead of us uh, between now and next Sunday. And uh, we're going to get a lot of rain. 
Yes, we're going to have uh, three shots. It looks like we'll have our first shot on Tuesday. Probably the most significant shot will be Thursday. And then just to round everything out for next weekend, next weekend looks like it, I'm not going to say right now it's going to be a complete washout, but showers will be arriving during the day on Saturday, carrying over into Saturday night and at least a part of Sunday. So we, we look to have at least a semi, if not completely, wet weekend next weekend. And yes, um, out of the next seven days, three of them, maybe four, will be wet. The only, the only bright spot in the upcoming week may be Friday. That'll be in between the two rain systems, the Thursday system and the Saturday system. Uh, Friday looks to be a bright day with sunshine. But other than that, that's the only bright spot I can look for, uh, or all of you can look for, for this upcoming week. Otherwise, as Joe uh, kicked off this uh, Joe and Joe session tonight, it's going to be gloom and doom. Doom, gloom and doom. I love that. Of course, everybody takes it to its, you know, uh, natural political conclusion when I use that because they think I'm making a comment, you know, trying to scare people. No, it's just that when in the springtime, particularly in the spring, or, or I, I think we could certainly call this, you know, this 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 obsession that somehow the season starts on a magic day at a magic moment when the sun crosses the equator, you know, the switch is flipped, and all of a sudden, oh, it's spring and the Birds are chirping and the flowers are blooming. Oh crap! Uh, you know, March is March is essentially a spring month. March is a spring month. March, April, May, the three fastest warming months of the year. That is the spring season. June, July, August is the summer. September, October, November is fall. December, January, February is winter. Okay, if you want to use the astronomical dates, if you're obsessed with that, you know that's your business, not well, you personally, Joe. But I'm just saying. No, but you're talking about even in, in terms of meteorological winter. What winter? This was more like springtime. I'm uh, just looking here at um, the uh, the statistics for not just February, but for the winter as a whole. First of all, February 2024, 4.2 degrees milder than average, becoming the 10th mildest February. This is for Central Park now. The 10th mildest February and the fourth leap year February to rank among the 10 mildest Februaries, again at Central Park, following a January that was 3.3 degrees milder than average, and a December that was a whopping 5.5 degrees above normal, these three months produced the fourth mildest meteorological winter on record, 4.3 degrees above normal, and it followed the third mildest winter that occurred just last year, and in additionally, the number of days completely above freezing, which never dropped below the freezing mark this winter, was 59, and that's the second most of any winter on record at Central Park. Well, what's the most, you may ask? Last winter, which had 60 days, the average number of days when we don't um, fall below 32 degrees, the average is 36. So it has been incredible these last two winters have really, really been very, very warm. And just like we had in January, there was about a week in February where we had winter-like conditions. The coldest reading on February 25th at Central Park, 23 degrees. Um, and that was the mildest, coldest reading on record of any February. You have to go back to 1869, and this February that we have just ended, the, the mildest coldest reading 23 on february 25th by far the mildest of any february on record in central park incredible yeah it just gary gardner says uh, you have to wonder whether what goes around comes around could you know the cold will it snap back and you know you are a, a you are a, 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 a proponent of the checkbook theory that it right. has to be balanced and I, I, I agree with that. I mean, at some point, it's going to be, there's going to be a snapback. But I, look, th there's there's a lot going on. Obviously, we continue to, you know, be in this sort of weird world uh, that, uh, you know, we're seeing things that we don't, we haven't, either haven't seen in a long, long time or have never seen before. Um no, keep, some... keep James. Keep James a second on the on the chat board. I'm sorry to interrupt, Joe. 
as quoting uh, my boss at the Hayden Planetarium, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is saying that the Arctic sheets are melting, which is causing all of this, and it may not revert back to normal. I would, I would, if, if Neil were here, I would point out to him that there is some exceedingly frigid air that has been over the polar regions. The, the main problem for us is that the jet stream, and we've been saying this all winter long, has been very unfavorable to deliver the very cold air into our part of the North American continent. We've been talking about a trough of low pressure that has been seemingly stuck and refuses to go away over uh, Alaska and Northwestern North America. And that has been the problem that has been diverting the cold air away from the Eastern part of the country. Now, if there is somehow a way, and it could be next year or the year after, that the jet stream goes into a different type of configuration and will allow some of that frigid air to come pouring down through the central and eastern part of North America, we're going to go back to very cold weather. In fact, I might point out, as mild as this winter was, last year in February, our low temperature at Central Park got all the way down to three, three degrees. I don't know how many of you remember that. That's just an example of what happens when the cold air can be diverted from the polar regions down into our part of the country. It's not that, you know, as as Neil Tyson might be uh, suggesting, that it's all going away. The cold air is going. It's, it's We're not seeing it anymore. It's very much up there. It's not so much that there's no more cold air anywhere on in the northern hemisphere. The problem, again, is the jet stream and maneuvering that jet stream to such a degree to bring down that cold air into our part of the country. And again, you're right, Joe. I am of the standpoint that nature ultimately balances the checkbook. The people in the New York area or in the eastern United States, the snow lovers, the winter weather lovers who are crying, saying, we're never going to see winter again. It's never going to get cold. We're never going to see cold or snowy conditions. You sound very much like the people in California who three or four years ago were on their knees begging for just a few drops of rain. Right. They it's had, never going to rain again. It's never going to rain again in California. It's it's climate change. It's global warming. This is it. We're done for. It's going to be done. And now, after being in not just drought, not just severe drought, but extreme drought in California three or four years ago, now they're on their knees. If they can get on their knees, if they don't float away with atmospheric river after atmospheric river or storm system after storm system hitting the west coast last year and now this year they're buried in the high terrain areas with as we pointed out the start of the show with snow where did this all come from this wasn't there four or five years ago when they were saying that it's all over for us and we're never going to see precipitation of significance here again it just completely has flipped and what i'm saying is that you know, all of you who are saying it's never going to snow again, it's never going to get cold here again. What I'm saying is that all you need is the jet stream to uh, rearrange its uh, current configurations and you'll be able to bring down some of that frigid air. I mean, you talk, Joe, the late Tex Antoine used to make reference to Alaska. And he used to say that Alaska is the Fort Knox of our winter weather eventually here in New York. Well, if you go to Anchorage, Alaska, which has had a few very mild winters too, this year, Alaska, uh, especially Anchorage and points north, have had some of the coldest and snowiest weather that they've had in many, many years. What happened? They, they say, this, this, it wasn't like this. When I went to Alaska for a solar eclipse in 2016, the Iditarod, the dog sled race, could not be held or cannot be could not be run in parts of Anchorage. They couldn't run through a right, parts because of, it was too warm. It was too not warm. Though, there, was, there was no snow, and they're saying like, "Oh, what's going to happen now in future winters? It's going to be terrible." This year, believe me when I tell you, they have more than enough snow for the idea. Right. Right. I, 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 I've been, you know, Brandon Darty brings up. What do you think of the new theory? It's not really that new. Uh, the new normal is less snowstorms, less snowstorms, but more snow with those storms. I think we've actually seen that in the last 20 some odd years, uh, where we've seen a lot of bigger storms, very few of the smaller ones. And even when we do get the smaller ones, there's a big jackpot zone in each one in, in, in them. So 
you know, I, that's probably part of the equation. And I also think, you know, I would guess that, look, not everything runs up in a straight line. So if if this is an up cycle that's going to continue, it is going to oh, be yeah. some 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 waves, you know, it's like the stock market. You rally and then you pull back and then you rally. So one of those snapbacks, um, I'll, 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 put, I'll say this. Um, there, when when the snapback comes, it's probably going to be um, a big one, a big snapback. Oh, no question uh, about yeah, it. I mean, you look at actually, if you look at what you know, one of the winters you could look at in a snapback mode like that was ninety five, ninety six, because if you look at the decade of the nineties, except for ninety three, ninety four, the superstorm in ninety three. Okay, the rest of the time it was kind of like this. Uh, especially from 97 to 2000. Um, but, you know, along came 1995, 96, and suddenly you had one year where you had three times the normal snowfall, at least it measured in New York City, and in a lot of other places, like, you know, where I was in central Long Island, we had almost 100 inches for the season, and Boston got, you know, Boston got the clobbered, or the winter of 13, 14, and 14, 15. You'll have something like that that'll just kind of be, It'll just sort of, sort of present itself inside this up cycle that we, that that we're in, and, and you know, let's also remember that it's it's not an either or thing here. Okay, it, it can be. You know, we've talked about this. You know, people seem to think that it's you know either it's global warming or it's cyclical. Okay, you know, I mean, it's climate. You know, let's either the 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 planet is warming and it's and it's climate change. Or it's sick, or it's cyclical. It can be both, okay. And you're putting warming on top of warming on top of warming. So you know the, the Earth's warmed two degrees since 1880, or whenever they use the whatever the reference point is. It's warmed two degrees from that, okay. Let's add another two degrees because of El Nino. Let's add another two degrees on top of that because of that volcanic undersea volcanic eruption. Uh, in the Pacific last year that spewed all that water vapor up into the stratosphere, that has had a real impact. And that impact might linger for a while. I mean, it's not something that's going to go away tomorrow. Yeah. Um, right. You know, that could that could be playing itself out over the course of several years or more. So we have to kind of see where this goes uh, it, 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 over time. But look, you know, it, it it is, I hate that phrase. I just hate it. But you know, this is what we have. These are the cards that we're dealt with. And we'll just have to, you know, we just play along and we do weather here. We don't really do climate. We do weather. Uh, we reference climate, but um, on the, you know, on, on the whole, by the way, speaking of which, I will also go on record. I might as well put this out there. And I've been talking about the fact that the only way you're going to see anything is if a window opens up. So um, I will say that. Um, in the last 10 days of this month, okay, there might be a chance for a small window to open up, okay? The last 10 days of the month. So figure from, figure around the 19th or the 20th to the end of the month, somewhere in there. I was looking to get some of the longer range ensembles and a few other things and kind of thinking that maybe in that time frame, there's a few things going on that, a window opens, but you know what? If it does, and I don't know that it will, but if it does, it's going to have to set up absolutely perfectly to pull it off. And you know, the funny thing is when you talk about global warming and climate change, if you look at the Central Park snow records going back to the mid and late 90s up until now or within the last few years, you will definitely notice that the amount of snow, you only listen up all you snow lovers, when Joe and I first started in this business back in the 70s, the average snowfall at Central Park for each winter was around 23, 24 inches at best. It has now gone all the way up to around 30 inches. We've tacked on an additional six inches. December was almost a non-month, a slack month. Right. You know, we get maybe an inch or two of snow in December. And there were Decembers, especially in the 2010s decade, where we were seeing 15 and even 20 inches of snow in December. And a lot of people, a lot of uh, knowledgeable people were saying, well, this is part of global warming. I know it's hard to understand climate change and global warming, but the reason why we're seeing more snow in New York is that the atmosphere is warmed up. 
Warmer atmosphere carries more moisture. When that moisture interacts with cold air, normal cold air over the winter season, that produces more snow. And so we ended up, according to those who watch the climate very carefully, we ended up with more snow, paradoxically to some, uh, because of climate change and global warming. Now, all of a sudden, we're not seeing it. And you're absolutely right, Joe. We had, we had the, uh, the uh, fact we had El Nino or even La Nina last year. It didn't seem to make much of a difference. But I think the biggest thing is that a blast, that volcanic blast, the Tonga undersea volcano, which, and that's the other thing. It wasn't your normal volcanic eruption like Penatubo in 1991, which blasted lots of ash and dust and aerosol cloud into the atmosphere. This thing was under the ocean. And so when it blasted, it sent a tremendous amount of water vapor into the atmosphere. How did that translate? What did that translate into um, in the last couple of years? It may very well have played into why we are seeing such unusual conditions now. And you're also right. Every volcano, uh, volcanic eruption, Penatubo, Krakatoa, um, uh, El Chicon in the 1980s, the, the, uh, the uh, effects, the residual effects don't last forever. After two or three years, all of that fades away, and then we go back to a more normal pattern. So it may very well be that next year it may not be quite the same as what we've seen the last couple of years. Um, and no, J Dog, it didn't affect the Earth's axis. Please, you know, talk seriously now. Uh, no volcano has the ability to do that. But the thing is, is that whatever happened from Tonga is probably going to fade out, if not next year, but the year after, and things are going to go back to normal. And Joe, that may very well be the so-called tipping scale. Maybe by uh, maybe by mid to late uh, in this decade, 2027, 2028, or whatever like that, we'll see a tip back. And then, as you said, there may be like a whiplash effect. We may end up seeing more snow than, than, than a lot of people care to see. And then what are people are going to say? I mean, uh, I, I honestly don't believe that we're going to be in this type of pattern that we're going to be seeing from day to day, excuse me, from year to year now, you know, snow amounts at Central Park, you know, five inches, eight inches, 10 inches. It's not going to happen. I don't, I, I honestly do not be believe that is going to be the case. We will go back to normal and maybe even well above normal snowfall. You're going to need a, you're going to, if you're going to, if you want to use the check, the checkbook theory, you're going to need, um, you're going to need a 60 inch plus winter to, to, to make it come out average. I mean, right? I mean, I mean, the average is 30. I mean, for New York City, it's 30. Well, uh, you don't so. necessarily have to make it up all in one one winter season. No, you but I mean, if you want to snap back two winters of, of single digits, you're going to have to have two winters where you're going to have to be almost twice the normal in order to just to bring it back down to the mean. Right. So right. there you go. You've, you got, way, you've, you've got two... You've either got one big snapback coming or two not giant snapbacks, but pretty pretty decent snapbacks uh, to look forward to at some, you know, at some future date. Who knows if it's next year or the year after or the year after that. Right. And uh, I pointed out on my Facebook page, in fact, I even had a picture of yours truly on his deck five years ago after he had shoveled off four inches of snow, went to bed and found another four inches on the ground the following morning. This was five years ago today. And so that's, and I said, it looks like they don't make winters like they used to anymore, but that was, that was only a few years ago. And believe me, we could very easily with a change of the jet stream winds, go right back to that type of a pattern uh, in the, uh, sometime in the next several years to come. Well, Adam Lowe, yeah. It, it, it isn't exactly written in stone that there's going to be a super La Nina let's, next year. So why don't we just wait for the La Nina to develop and see where that takes us? Okay. And, and why don't not, we, what do I we mean, do? Would every single one of these things have to be super? <laughs> like super well, moon? But, but when you think about it, well, no, I understand that. But but you're right. You know, everything has to be taken to its natural, you know, apocalyptic conclusion. But um, – no, if, if if you're going to have, if you're going to, you know, we seem to be just kind of edging more toward the extremes all the time. I mean, even just the day to day weather events, you know, looking at what these weather events this week, are we going to be dealing with, you know, big soaking rains? Are we going to, you know, 
break a you know put us on an, a record pace for the month of Mar for the month of March as far as rainfall is concerned because you know it is going to be sizable. We've seen you know small systems just sort of you know magically outperform. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if uh, you know, Tuesday system winds up outperforming and the other two also. But we'll we'll get to that in a second. Uh, uh, Paul Roman, thank you for hitting uh, Super Chat tonight. It is most appreciated. And Brandon Doherty, also, thank you uh, very much for the compliment and for hitting uh, the Super Chat um, uh, tip jar. So uh, anyhow. Uh, oh, what was? Oh. Oh, 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 I forgot about this. This is important. You're gonna I know you're going to love this, Joe, Mr. Rayo, okay? We have a new model. Really? Oh, yeah. oh model. Yes, 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 yes. It I is, saw that. Right. It is an AI. I, I, think, I think this is what it is. It's an artificial intelligence version of the European. Okay, and it's on Tropical Tidbits, so I'll bring it up. The AI Euro, uh, I, I, I've looked at it over the last couple of days. I'm, I, I didn't look at it close enough to get a grasp of whether how it's handling things. That's going to take. That's probably going to take me a couple of months to figure out. But it'll be an interesting tool to see if it can outperform the um, the standard models. If AI can produce a better weather model than What's on the table already? That ought to be that ought to be interesting to see how that plays. Now, didn't you say that they were going to phase out the operational European? The operational European was gone. It may already be gone. Uh, I don't know for sure. Uh, and it's being replaced by uh, one of the Euro control, <clears throat> the one of the Euro control runs is going to be the new operational run. And they're putting more, they continue to put more computing power into the ensembles. So they got rid of the operational. Correct. And it, it, what they also said on, on uh, Tropical Tidbits is that the grid has now gotten smaller. So it's something like it goes from 0.5 yes. to 0.25 or whatever. So let's see if that makes things better or if it makes things worse. By the way, just going back to the Truckee, California thing, I, I, uh, you know, I was searching for webcams. And unfortunately, most of the the webcams that are up don't really show very much on uh, Interstate 81 that are far outside of that area. Uh, but once you get close enough, they're all down. So uh, we can't even look at the pictures. <laughs> That's well, maybe they can maybe they can get somebody like you know in, in those uh, trials where you're not allowed to bring a camera in. They have an artist conception uh, artist drawing. Of the people in the inside, as to what's going on, so maybe they should get an artist to to draw to draw what's going on with the with the blizzard. In which case, they don't have to do very much. They could just show you a blank white piece of paper and say, "Here, this is what it looks like out there." <laughs> exactly. I'm just trying to look something up. Okay, um, here we go. Let's see. No, I don't need that. Um, all right, never mind. I, 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 so just don't mind me. I was just kind of I was googling something, uh, but it, it didn't turn out to to be what I was looking for. Okay, um, winter storm warnings are still up for parts of northern California and southern Oregon. The blizzard warnings are down to two counties. Uh, we've got winter storm watches up for southeastern Oregon and a couple of counties in uh, Idaho. We have winter storm warnings up for uh, the the western quarter of uh, the northwestern quarter of Colorado and uh, into a small portion of south central Wyoming. And we've got a few counties with winter storm warnings and winter weather advisories in the Dakotas. No watches and warnings up in the east. There's some dense fog advisories along the Gulf Coast. We've got red flag warnings in parts of Texas and Oklahoma and on up into eastern Colorado and western Nebraska and southern South Dakota. Some wind advisories in parts of the southwest, as well as uh, up in northern North in North Dakota and northwestern Minnesota, and uh, today, I mean, we were sort of in no man's land as far as flow is concerned. So we didn't really get much of a wind off the ocean to hold temperatures down. We had sunshine. You know, a lot of people were saying how there was mostly a cloud-free sky for 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 much, if not all, of the day, and that was certainly the case with high pressure 
kind of pushing down into the southeast. But we've got this old frontal boundary from Saturday's system that's sitting off the southeast coast. And we're going to get a little low, okay, that's going to form on this and just sort of skedaddle its way up the coast for Tuesday. And then you've got this, you know, kind of wrapped up low in eastern North Dakota, uh, but um, not a whole lot of precip with this. And sort of a, I don't know, a, a, a pinwheel of warm fronts and cold fronts that, that are being analyzed here, uh, spinning around that. And then, of course, you have the west, where the which left now the, the storm on the surface is up west of Seattle, and you've got the upper air feature that really was the big driver in all of this uh, that is uh, coming inland, and that's going to be, you know, the problem going forward. And you can already see some moisture gathering off the Florida coast and off the Carolina coast with this, you know, developing little low that's going to come up. But we've got some time, and skies are still fairly clear from uh, central New England uh, down into uh, Virginia and then going west into the Ohio Valley. There's some clouds in the southeast. Uh, a little bit of a subtropical jet starting to form again in the uh, out of the Pacific into the Gulf of Mexico. Some high cloud streaming there, and you've got still moisture coming in uh, to the west. Uh, that's uh, that energy still uh, causing some issues. And here's what the radar looks like, and uh, still some waves of precipitation here in Cali central and northern California. And on up into Washington and Oregon, uh, also some patches in Idaho and Utah and into Colorado. Nothing outstanding at the moment, uh, except for what's on the, you know, this patch that's in the Sierra Nevadas. You've got uh, some snow here. You have to almost go to the Canadian border to get it. Look at this. I mean, you got to go to the northwestern corner of Minnesota to probably get into some snow. And on the east side of that, there are some uh, rain showers that are moving up in northern Wisconsin and into east. It's raining in Duluth. I mean, how how bizarre is that? Okay, yeah. it is raining in Duluth. Okay, that says it all as far as um, you know, what we're dealing with here. And here's WPC's. Uh, this is a pretty bullish forecast, Joe. They've got they've got that light orange area is four to five inches in southeastern New England. This is the seven day forecast. So this takes us through next Sunday night. So it covers. All three systems here. Um, I got these patches of four to five inches in southeast New England, another patch in southwest Connecticut, another patch in northwest New Jersey, and a small portion of southeast PA, and a very large area of two and a half to four inches uh, from southeastern New England down through Virginia. And then uh, you get down to me uh, in northern Georgia, northwestern South Carolina, western North Carolina. Uh, they've got that hatched area. That's that's five inches plus, um, five to seven uh, for you know going back into Alabama. So very wet weather across the South. You know, maybe the fact that it's spread out is going to minimize some flooding problems. But I think when we get into tomorrow, we'll probably start to see some flood watches go up in some places uh, in the eastern in, and in the west. It's kind of calmed down a bit. Still some heavy precip along the coast north of San Francisco, on up uh, the immediate coast to Washington, several to many inches there. And as far as snow is concerned, we can look at the west. This is the probability of two, uh, and uh, I'll change it to eight. So we still have some active weather where we've got some watch the, the warnings up in southwestern Oregon and in the Sierra Nevada. Still uh, high probabilities for at least an additional eight inches as well as uh, parts of western Wyoming, eastern Idaho, central Idaho, and a couple of dots there in, in western Colorado where you've got um, 30 to 40% probabilities. And in the east, not a flake, not an ice pellet, nothing. Nothing, Joe. Zero. Nada. <laughs> no well, I had asked you before. I had asked you before we came on the air about uh, Thursday and whether or not you thought that maybe we might be looking at a very significant snowfall, not for us here in the New York area, but maybe for parts of central and especially northern New England and far upstate New York uh, for Wednesday night to Thursday. It might be just cold enough. And as that system that's expected to bring us rain here might possibly bring for inland locations and especially elevated locations, a very significant snowfall. 
Uh, I think you got to, well, let's see. First of all, let's, let's, here's this little low. You know, this kind of looks like something you would see in June. Like a little, like a little spinning low that forms off the North Carolina coast during the day tomorrow. You already saw, see the seeds out there on the satellite. And it's got a small patch of rain and heavy rain that comes up. Now, depending on what model you use, you know, it kind of takes it either inland or closer to the coast. But it is it is a small area that probably could put down a quick half an inch to an inch as it goes by. And then separate from that, you've got some of that California energy. Let me let me widen this. It's probably better if I use the U.S. so we can take a look, you know, what's going on in the West Coast because they're still getting moisture coming in. So, you know, that goes up. And now you've got this second low that forms in southern Georgia and then lifts northeastward. Now, I don't think you're going to see much of I really don't think you're going to see much from this Wednesday or Wednesday night in, in, with this first low from Wednesday. It might be the one for Saturday that probably is, it, it get new, you know, upstate New York and New England have a shot. But this Wednesday low is going to be you know loaded with some heavy rain areas during the day on Wednesday into Wednesday night, particularly up in New England, if you see what the GFS is doing. And then that goes out. And then there's a third one. And this one, I think, probably has a chance to get some cold air in those areas in upstate New York and in New England uh, with with a, an upper low that's going to get involved. By the way, this was one, if you go back to late last week, I don't know if it was Thursday or Friday, it, it, uh, one of the runs of the GFS was, you know, had two to three feet in southeast of snow in southeastern New England. It had um, just inland of the coast around New York City and west. It had a foot to a foot and a half. and of course. You know, a few a few idiots took the bait on that, and I saw, you know, one one Philly TV station was playing it up of a big snowstorm coming uh, for uh, this week. I mean, you know, please, please stop, and 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 then that goes out, and you know, after that we do get a bit of a break. So this week's a washout. You know, not all not, not all the time, but. You know, a lot of the time it will be. But after that last system goes by, then we're up to March, Monday, March 11th. That week, actually, it, the way it's setting up, it's setting up to be pretty dry. So Sal Blandino will be able to do some, you know, get some recovery time, um, recovering from the weather that's coming up this week. No, Raymond O'Hara on the chat board says e e c m f uh, w f um, the uh, artificial intelligence model predicts a blizzard for Northeast for next Sunday for, for FWIF for what it's worth. Uh, I should point out if that does indeed forecast snow, it's again, as I said, central and Northern New England, not for the New York metropolitan area or for Southern New England. It's simply going to be too warm for that, but for inland areas, well inland and elevated locations. Yeah. It'll be something maybe to watch. Uh, call, you know, call me up again for Thursday or Friday of next week, and we'll get into a greater discussion about it. But yeah, uh, there's no there's no real cold air. I mean, there's yeah. a little bit of cold air up in Canada. This is kind of like the system in February. Only now it's March, and the normals are ten degrees higher, or whatever. Or they by the time we get to this weekend, they'll they'll will be you know seven or eight degrees higher. Uh, that low, I mean, I'm looking at this. I have the European AI up. Uh, and, you know, it's got a surface low that goes into south, into southern Ohio. It actually goes into eastern Ohio. You've got screaming southerly isobars here. And then the low redevelops, you know, somewhere in Delaware Bay and moves right over Long Island. So, yeah, Joe, you're right. I mean, if this is going to be a, a problem, it's going to be from well up into upstate New York and, and in well, you know, northern New England. Unless, unless, uh, and I will just caution because, you know, the cold air, the, 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 the few events that we've had with models showing cold air in eastern Canada kind of being there and sort of trying to press down has not happened, okay? So um, I, I don't know why it would happen this time around, so I, I'll, you know, I'll, just, I'll just leave it at that. And the other thing is about the 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 uh, the AI European Joe is that it actually goes out the the old European only goes out went out to two forty, the, the 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 operational run only went out to two forty. This one goes out to three sixty, right? 
So, you know, it's kind of ma almost matched up now finally with the, uh, the, the yeah, TFS at 384. Right. So, you know, one here's thing I noticed, uh, one thing I've noticed with the uh, with the artificial intelligence model of the uh, European is that it doesn't show quite as much. I mean, like I, I saw a flash or two of yellow indicating, you know, moderate to heavy rainfall. Right. It doesn't show all that. I mean, like it's not like the GFS, which is, tends to show a lot more of that. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, let, know. let's let me get the let's see what they have at the precip here. Total accumulated precip. So let's roll for this week. Uh, you know, at least through Friday and into Saturday. I mean, it's got you know the white and the purplish area here. That's three to four inches, and you know it, it doesn't have as much, and the, the WPC that you know has the big amounts also in the south which the european does pick it up on saturday with with, with that weekend system well at least in terms of what it shows as total precip it's pretty bullish uh with the big amounts it kind of looks like what wpc did uh, right you're right though when when it comes to the rainfall the mat, mslp and precip you know there's some darker greens in there but it's not showing up the yellows you know, which which would be a half an inch is that is that what that is i mean it's average precipitation rate of millimeters per hour it's millimeters per hour so um you know those darker greens are like three three and four millimeters per hour so now they got to make us do math to convert millimeters to inches um but there you go uh, but the upper air, just kind of look at the upper air on this. I mean, I, we could pull out any model we want and just, you know, come to the same conclusion, I think. Um, <clears throat> the trough in Alaska has been, to the West Coast, has been a huge issue all winter long with just those, except for those brief windows. Um, we see troughing in Alaska continuing through this week uh, and into next weekend and into the following week. Uh, still have it there, but then it goes away. And for the first, you know, we're seeing a ridge actually off the, along the West Coast building up into Western Canada. And this is now around March 15th, 16th, with some sort of deep trough in the eastern part of the United States. So the models have been kind of showing this in the long range recently. And it seems to be having a little bit of staying power uh, in, in, in the runs. So there's a little bit of confidence in this idea that I have in my head that maybe after, say, um, you know, let's say from March 18th or 19th on, somewhere in there, if you have a perfect setup, uh, you might you might have a shot for some. Uh, there is a cold right. flow from Canada setting up here, so there's that. And the other thing is, and this is something that <clears throat> maybe Rocky will finally, you know, Bowie will finally pull the rabbit out of the hat. As we've been seeing the models trying to split the polar vortex in two all winter long, and it, it's never happened. And it just kept going up and you know reforming into a tight little ball. Well, this time around, we're now actually at the 168 hours. So we're at seven days when there's a split that occurs. And one vortex goes into Europe and Siberia. The other vortex drops down into eastern Canada. It uh, looks like the stronger vortex actually drops down into eastern Canada. So that would be supportive of us maybe going into uh, a negative NAO for the last couple of weeks of the month uh, or maybe the last 10 days of the month. So this would lend support to the idea of the, if there is going to be a window, it's going to come, you know, late in the month. And everything's going to have to set up perfectly in order for us to pull up, you know, in order to pull off um, uh, one last chance for an accumulating snowfall. And for the first time in about four days, Dr. Ju Judah Cohen has finally posted something on Twitter. He did it only a few hours ago. And he says, because I have OCD, that's um, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, still busy trying to rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic. Uh, weather models predicting the polar vortex split with major sister vortex over North America started in Eurasia, but polar vortex forecast suggested winter could very well end in North America. New blog tomorrow. So well, we'll have to wait till tomorrow to see what else he has to that's say. That's a long range issue. We'll deal with it when we get there. The big deal this week is going to be the rain that's coming up. Uh, 
<laughs> I'm at 99 likes, by the way. Oh, well. Anybody so, oh, it to... just went to 100. You may ring the bell. Ring the bell. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. There you are. All right, so let's play Briller Jeopardy on this Sunday night, shall we? Yeah, surely. Uh, do you want to do that? Before before we do Briller Jeopardy, should we talk about two things, the scheduling for this week and the potential special guest we will have a week from tomorrow night? Yes, or? let's do that. Let's do yeah. that now. All right, I, I, I want to alert all of you right now, and I've already alerted uh, Mr. Chiaffi, uh, that uh, this month of March is going to be very busy for me. I'm going to be giving lots and lots of virtual uh, talks to libraries and civic groups about the impending or upcoming solar eclipse. And this particular week, there are going to be three nights, tomorrow, Tuesday, and Wednesday, that I have talks scheduled for 7 p.m. That means that the earliest we can get a show going will be 8.30. So instead of 7.35, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week, it would have to be 8.30. We would have a normal... 735 show on Thursday, but the first three nights of this week, it would be 830, Joe, um, unless you have some other idea. Uh, as to no, how we're, can... we're good. 830 is fine. And the other the other thing is that we just recently had Alan Casper uh, as our special guest here on Joe and Joe. And one of Alan's, uh, a person who considered Alan to be his mentor um was uh the gentleman who has been doing the weather at fox 5 for over 35 years and we extended an invitation to him and he has accepted and so a week from tomorrow night march 11th put it on your calendar we are going to have nick gregory as our special guest here on joe and joe so that's going to be a very special night for us having nick come on and so we'll be able to chat with him and you folks will be able to throw some questions out at him. Uh, but again, uh, unless something happens, uh, something unusual happens for him to suddenly cancel, which I don't think Nick will do, because he said he watched the Alan Casper interview, was very intrigued and very, very uh, enjoyed it very much and said, hey, whenever you want me to come on. So we threw out that invitation. He took it and he will be here a week from tomorrow night, March 11, 7.35 p.m. And again, First three nights of this week, Joe and Joe, 8.30 p.m., Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. He thinks we're going to be gentle. <laughs> well, Nick Nick is like the, the Cal Ripken of local television. He has been on longer than any. He, his, he dates back to Fox 5, 1986. 1980, I mean, in two years, Nick will be on that station for 40 years. And the only other person who could make a uh, who could approach that, not on TV but on radio, would be Craig Allen. Believe I, I think I ought to contact Craig and ask him if he wants to come on because he he's been on since nineteen I think seventy nine or nineteen eighty. So we're, we're, all of a sudden, Joe, we're getting the local weathercasters. They've they've heard that it is a great privilege and pleasure to be on Joe and Joe, and uh, hopefully well, we'll be more uh, after. You know, Joe. I mean, you know, when, with these these up and coming talents, um, you know, they finally realize that you know, this, you know, being on this show is the big time. Well, you know, the funny thing is that with 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 uh, Lee Goldberg, uh, maybe not with Alan because Alan Alan predated us on on the air, um, and uh, and and Nick too. They say, you know, it, what a privilege, how how wonderful it is to be on with you guys. We, I guess we're looked upon now by some as the elder statesmen of local weather. In fact, Lee Goldberg, when I did the uh, when I did the podcast with him about the eclipse, in the introduction, he referred to me as uh, one of the deans of local weather casting here in New York. I said to myself, man, am I am I that old? <laughs> Patrick Darcy, I'm going to let Joe answer your question. I did. <laughs> Figure it out, Reuben Fairchild. Figure it out. Okay. Um, right. So on that note, uh, 
Now, I have the Alfred Hitchcock. This this is mine, right? Yes, it's Brother Jeopardy tonight, and you have Alfred Hitchcock. Right. The Alfred Hitchcock uh, Brother Jeopardy. We're turning away from movies for the moment. And let me just get them here off on Facebook. Thank you, Miss Blue Ocean, by the way. Thank you. That's really kind of you to say. Thank you. All righty. Where are you, Mr. Chan? There we go. Here we go. So tonight... We're going to take a break from weather on Briller Jeopardy and go to one of Mr. Chaffee's favorite movie directors, Alfred Hitchcock. So this is more or less for you, Joe, and also for people on the chat board. Are you ready? Oh, I'm, I'm ready. I mean, I don't know if my memory's fading lately, so it's getting harder and harder for me to remember things. But no matter, I'll give it my best shot. Okay, here's question one. The heroine of which Hitchcock movie found a shrunken head in her bed. <laughs> the a heroine, heroine. Of Hitchcock movie who found a shrunken head in her bed. A shrunken head? In her bed. In her bed. Yes. I'm going to go throw a big hint to you, Joe. Don't be a goat and not be able to answer this question. Don't be a goat. Don't be a goat. Oh, God. I'm really thinking very hard here. I don't ever remember seeing a scene where the heroine finds a shrunken head. I mean, unless it was Janet Lee in Psycho. But I don't remember that happening. Because he had um, Anthony Perkins' character had you know, all these stuff taxidermy dead animals um, running around. But I, I don't think that's the answer. Krishnapedia says the birds is my answer for all of the questions because oh. I know nothing about Alfred Hitchcock. A, Jason, shrunken, a shrunken head in the bed. I don't ever remember a Hitchcock movie that had a shrunken head in the bed. Yeah. Are you ready for the answer? Well, I'll, hold on. Give me another moment. I mean, the only thing, and I vaguely remember it, his last movie which I can't even remember what the title of it was. Patrick Dorsey said Frenzy, no. Rich Rothmansky, Marnie, no. No. Um, this is just the Godfather movie where he wakes up in bed with a dead horse, no. <laughs> well, it wasn't even his last movie. Shrunken head. Oh, God. Hmm. And you don't know, it doesn't say who the heroine is. No. I could look it up for you. Do you want me to look uh, it up? Under Capricorn, under Capricorn. Ah, yes. See, I knew you'd eventually get it. Get well, it? Matthew Howe um, oh. helped me out because he said something Capricorn. I think okay. it's under Capricorn. I, I think that I, honestly, I don't. I think that movie I've only seen once. I have to go. I have to go back and look at it or see it again. Thank you, Frank. Our family plot. I could not remember that. That's where, uh, the, that title. that's where the hint, and that's where the hint came from. Don't be a goat, because Capricorn, the goat. No, the anyway. goat. Okay. All right, number two. What was the trouble in the movie? The trouble with Harry. With Harry. Yes. That's one movie that I, one of Hitchcock's movies that I didn't care for. So I only, I, I've only sort of watched it once. Um, but I mean, Harry was. Uh, uh, was Harry the one the, the 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 one that was dead? That's what was the trouble with was with Harry. Harry was yes. dead. Harry was dead. Yes. All right. Here's one I know what you're going to get. In the film Psycho, what was Norman Bates's hobby? Well, the, he the taxidermy. Right. So stuffing he was stuffing the, stuffing stuffing wild animals. Yes. All right. So you Birds. got that. Right. Now, in number four, in Shadow of a Doubt. Shadow of a Doubt, which I think it was one of Hitchcock's best movies, by the way. If you've never Probably. seen it, 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 it it's, it's just genius okay. from start to finish. So you'll certainly get this one. In Shadow of a Doubt, how does the central villain die? Oh, uh, well, Joe, the Joseph Cotton ca character, Uncle Charlie. Uh, he, he, uh, he falls out of a train, a, a moving train. Absolutely. Absolutely. And number five, what actor headlined Rear Window? 
what actor headlined? Yes. It should be Jimmy Stewart. And that's right. All right. Jimmy Stewart. And now finally, the bonus question. How many films did Alfred Hitchcock direct? And here, this is a multiple choice. A, 39, B, 49, C, 59, and D, 69. How many films did he direct? I'm going to, you know, 39 sticks in my head. And then, of course, there's the movie 39, his movie 39 Steps. Um, and then he did a lot of, he did a lot of stuff in the 30s in Britain before he came to the, to the U.S. But his movies in the U.S. were not, you know, it's like, it's not like he did one ever, you know. I, I, I'm going to say 39. Well, unfortunately, it was not A, it was D, 69. 69. So, because he did, a, he did a lot of stuff in the 30s before he came to America. Um, he did a lot of stuff in the 30s in Britain. And I actually have seen a lot. I haven't seen all of his early stuff, but I've seen some of his early stuff. And you could see the, the his style of directing and what he was doing then and how he perfected that over the years. I've got a big Hitchcock book here in the house somewhere. I have to take it out and reread it. Man was just the man was just genius. He was. He, yes, he's he had um <clears throat> there's some famous quotes of Mr. Hitchcock. Um and you know what I've I have not done in a long time all of a sudden, you know, when it's uh, since I since we got the dog, since Mr. Sweeney arrived in our lives a year ago. Now, almost a year ago, he came in here on March 15th. Before Mr. Sweeney arrived, I used to sit in our television room upstairs and I would watch um, by myself, I might add, because Renato would go to bed. <laughs> but I would watch I would watch on MeTV, Perry Mason, Twilight Zone, and sometimes I'd, I'd stay up and watch Alfred Hitchcock Presents until like 1.30 or 2 in the morning. I don't do that anymore. I kind of miss doing that. I haven't seen Alfred Hitchcock now in a Long, long time, but he, and, and I he, wish they he didn't. He didn't direct those. Um, I, I understand that, but I mean, just to watch him and you know make fun of, let's say, the commercials, and now here's an obnoxious commercial. <laughs> yes, he brought that. I, yeah, the thing about I, the sponsor and, and uh, that uh, that television show. I, the, my favorite, my very favorite uh, episode was Lambs to the Slaughter. Well, a woman, a woman beats her husband. Oh yeah, Barbara Bel Getty. Barbara Bel Getty's using a frozen leg of lamb, and then when they yes. come to investigate, she serves the investigators the leg of lamb. There's um, uh, 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 uh he says his some of his be his quotes are the length of a film should be directly related to the endurance of the human bladder. <laughs> And this is so, this next one is so true because his movies are not about because there is no terror in the bang, okay? There's no terror in the bang. In other words, it, you know somebody being shot or something exploding, only in the anticipation of it. And if you watch, you know his movies, you know what's coming, and that's that's the thing. You know what's coming. You know pretty much who's who's doing it, okay? Uh, and it's all about the buildup in suspense. Uh, if you watch um, w one of the best um, examples of that, I think, is in the man the uh, 1954 um, version of the Man Who Knew Too Much. Um, there's a 12 minute sequence in, in Alfred in the Alfred Hall uh, during a, a concert, and you know that some uh, uh, they're trying to assassinate the prime minister of some country. Okay. And the Doris Day character knows it's going to happen, but she, she can't do anything about it because uh, they're holding her son as uh, as a hostage and they're going to kill him. Right. So, you know, you're sitting there for 12 minutes wondering, is she going to, you know, is she going to do something to stop this? Um, and, of course, the music is playing. You know who the assassin is because he's sitting there with a woman, you know, to to get ready to shoot this guy and you know it's it's one of the greater scenes you just sit the first remember i remember the first time i saw that i was like literally on the edge of my seat trying to figure um 
to figure out how that was going to go. He said, to me, Psycho was a big comedy. It had to be. Okay. Um, uh, even my failures make money and become classics a year after I make them. Always make the audience suffer as much as possible. Drama is life with the dull bits cut out. I think that makes, you know, there's a lot of sense here. Um, One of the biggest disappointments I had was when our kids were, I think my son was like seven or eight, my daughter was like five, and the, the birds was coming on, I think on TBS or TNT or whatever. And I, I built this up with them. I said, you want to see a really scary movie? A real, oh yeah, we want to see a scary movie. And, they, and I, I, I thought they were going to get, I remember when I first saw the birds, I was like, Aah! and Joe, neither one of them, they, they watched the movie and they kept looking at me like, when's the scary part coming? You know, this is what, what is this? It's not, not anything big. You know, it's, I don't understand. Maybe the younger generation doesn't look at fear the same way we did when we were their age, but, uh, no, because we uh, have to use our brains. <laughs> no, I'm serious, Joe. You know, unless it's right in front of them, they have no they have no concept of understanding and, and imagination. You know, they've grown up in a world where, you know, they've got a screen in front of them with a keyboard and, you know, there's no imagination involved, not in my opinion. And so, you know, they, unless they see it in front of them, that to them, you know, is much more uh, makes an impact as opposed to having it in your mind. And I would say that it's 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 the latter that really really makes you know is more important. I love and this it's... quote. I love this quote of his here. Where I just lost it. I'm a typed director. If I made Cinderella, the audience would immediately be looking for a body in the coach. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that that's a great that is a great quote. Yeah. Uh, and where would he be in the and, and, if, and he appeared in every movie as in a cameo, in one way, shape, or form. So he, maybe he'd be one of the uh, one of the people who would help Cinderella into the into the uh, carriage, you know, one of the royal guardsmen or whatever. <laughs> when I remember actor... the birds in the birds. He was coming out of the pet shop when Tippy Hedren, Hedren was going in. So when an actor comes to me and wants to discuss his character, I say. It's in the script. If he says, but what's my motivation? I say, your salary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, God. That's all right. Great. So tomorrow, 24 hours from now, we will have only just gotten started because, again, tomorrow night, Joe and Joe will begin at 830. And I want to thank Brendan Doherty and Paul Roman for hitting the tip jar tonight. And thank you to all 124 of you who hit the like button tonight on a Sunday night here on Joe and Joe. Yep. And uh, we will, uh, we'll see you tomorrow at eight 30 and don't forget mark it down. It's a week from tomorrow, not tomorrow, a week from tomorrow that we will have uh, Nick Gregory on. Uh, so be sure you don't miss that show. Yes. All right. Um, all right. So have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. Night night. Night night.